The Witch Queen, the newest major expansion for Destiny 2, is showing off her worm babysitting skills. Hunters are getting nerfed because there's too damn many of them. The most hated man in the galaxy is now a super nice dude, and Sony's buying Bungie, aka Destiny 2, for $3.6 billion. And I have yet to be anywhere close to hitting the top 10 on a world first raid race. This is Destiny 2 five years later. And I know it's only technically been four and a half years since Destiny 2 launched, but we're starting year five and it's kind of confusing, so just get off my back. Destiny is a space magic online first person shooter from the developers who created Marathon. Oh, and also Halo. The first game broke all kinds of grounds, creating a fresh blend of genres, a deep new universal lore, and great online shooting gameplay. It was also delay plagued and launched with a grind heavy upgrade system worse than a DMV website. And it was slow to release expansion content, at one point going an entire year without a new substantial release. Even with its greatest fans, and there were many, Destiny 1 was a unique pain in the ass. While the Destiny franchise is an MMO in many ways and was from the beginning, Bungie's plan was always to release a sequel every few years, like they had for their Master Chief money printing machine. Hardcore players had three years to settle into the masochistic rhythms of the first Destiny when Bungie revealed Destiny 2. This would serve as an opportunity to redeem the franchise with a completely new title that was ready to go from launch. There were better graphics, better systems, and a stronger focus on the narrative campaign elements. This was great news, but it meant all the thousands of hours Destiny 1 players had spent grinding their way to a god roll exotic plasma rifle was about to be nullified. Destiny 2 was hitting the reset button on all your progression, and to make matters worse, the devs were gonna make it accessible. Right from the jump, Bungie made it clear that Destiny 2 was designed to be a more thoughtful, well-meaning, and accessible video game. The developers had the admirable goal of making a game that felt more like an enjoyable video game and less like a second job, which of course was met with overwhelming outrage. Destiny 2 reset the franchise from both a loot and narrative perspective. The Cabal faction of bad guys took center stage with their leader Gaul taking control of the giant alien golf ball. The Guardians were now depowered without their magic space pixie dust, and it was time to start climbing back up that mountain. Like the first game, players could choose to be either human, human GMO, or robot. And classes had a simple three pillar system. Most people pick Hunter, I assume because of the cape, then warlocks make fun of hunters, and everyone makes fun of titans. It's a perfect natural system. The game presented lots of quality of life improvements and really set itself up for backlash by not being either Destiny 1 or a completely different franchise. The hardcore players thought it was too easy, and I have empathy for that position. I mean, who among us hasn't had a codependent relationship with a busted progression system that abuses you until you learn to do things the way it wants you to? even if what it wants you to do makes no damn sense. The first piece of DLC that dropped was The Curse of Osiris. The hardcore community backlash got even worse. Osiris was an incremental improvement and rebalancing, while many voices were crowing for a complete overhaul. Between a refusal by some to start the grind all over again by jumping from a maxed out Destiny 1 game over to Destiny 2, and an unwillingness by Bungie to completely remake the entire game into three months to appease a portion of vocal fans, many players left Destiny altogether. Maybe it's to go to Battlefront 2. You like the grind? We got the time. 100 hours for Darth Vader, 100 hours for Luke Skywalker, and just for the unbelievable deal of 200 hours for both Darth Vader and Luke Skywalker. Regardless of where they went, players who bailed on Destiny 2 quickly missed out on the laser tag weekend. In a shooter that is so complicated and frequently changing, you occasionally find exploits that developers missed. Sometimes it's a way to farm rare resources without putting in all the work. Sometimes it's just a weapon so overpowered that it kills everyone in its path. Like the Telesto rifle that breaks in Destiny more often than our coffee machine in the office, and the Vex Mytho class before that, but Prometheus Lens, that was extra. See, this exotic rifle was a laser pointer of doom. The weapon was designed to fire a continuous beam, but if players tapped the trigger over and over, it fired an instant kill bolt, and if you did it right, it never ran out of ammo. It was broken. The fans knew it. Bungie knew it. And what could have been a quiet patch on the down low went out the window after a taunt from a fan. Bungie embraced the meme, and they made the gun purchasable in-game. Instantly, everyone online was destroying each other. It was insane. It was also fun. And Bungie needed something, anything, I mean anything, to help Destiny 2 stand out. So what do you do next to make a splash? Why not kill off the most beloved character in the whole damn franchise? 
The year after launch, Destiny 2 teed up their first major expansion, The Forsaken, where Bungie goes full Sephiroth and has this guy Aldrin Solve murder this guy Cade 6. But to understand why this is so painful to all gamers, you need to understand Cade 6. He's a robot slash EXO, he's funny, and he's voiced by Nathan Fillion and occasionally Nolan North. He was front and center for the marketing campaigns and that made players laugh with moments like this. Long story, and it may look like I don't know what I'm doing, but I do, maybe not, it doesn't matter. This is my serious face. Can't you tell? I can either shoot or work on this thing, but not both, because they just shot off my arm. Now let's go to prison. <laughs> Kate is an exo, a humanoid machine, and that number at the end of his name signifies how many times he's been resurrected, which can make you twitchy when you're hitting your mid 40s in the resurrection business. Some fans saw killing Kate as a cheap tactic to goose interest into Destiny 2's expansion content. Some saw it as the franchise's first delivering a promise to put a greater emphasis on deeper lore and story. Either way, Bungie popped Cade 6 like a grape, and the guy who did it was a sniveling little shit from the first game named Aldrin Sob. And so like Pavlov ringing a dinner bell, Bungie set an entire player base on a hunt for blood to bring Aldrin down with as much pleasure as possible. By the end of the campaign, Aldrin would be dead, only to be resurrected as a crow with no memory of the bad thing he did. And to add insult to injury, he's actually helpful and now cool with the Guardians again. And I'll say, Bungie is making the right move focusing on an extending and developing long-running character growth rather than churning out new ones at a clip. Not long after Cade separated from this mortal coil, Bungie separated from Activision in 2019. The publisher and game studio had always seemed to be a mismatch. It was clear that Activision was always focused on maximum profitability and Bungie was just trying to focus on the quality over anything else, including deadlines and the release windows. After some sniping from Activision about how the Forsaken expansion hadn't performed the way that it was supposed to and Bungie firing back that both fans and the developers themselves thought it performed just great, it was clear that there was some tension sizzling under the surface. Soon after the split from Activision, Bungie converted Vanilla Destiny 2 and the early DLC content to free to play permanently, with the understanding that expansions would still cost money when they were new, but would also eventually become free to all players to help lower the barrier for new players to try out the game. But the Traveler giveth, and the Traveler taketh away with the launch of the Beyond Light expansion. Players learned a new acronym, DCV. The Destiny Content Vault is the Mary Poppins bag where Bungie locks away content from the game world that they wanted to take off the map. This could be specific raids or the entire planet locations. This includes content that many players paid real money for in the first place. The explanation from Bungie is they need to keep the game world optimized, and pulling content that is no longer being played very much out of the persistent game universe is a good, clean way to do it. And as long as they keep releasing new content to dive into, I'm not mad at it. But then they started sunsetting weapons. Bungie, Bungie, Bungie. Destiny 2 suddenly level capped entire swaths of weapons, permanently nerfing them. These were the weapons that players earned from grinding our raids over and over again to not only get the weapon drop, but trying to get that perfect god roll of perks. It would be one thing if the sun setting was to shift the community over to new weapon types, but no, lo and behold, the new raids would drop very similar weapons to replace the ones that were just locked up in the permanent timeout. Eventually Bungie stopped sunsetting the weapons, but we remember what you did. We remember. And while restarting on your kit is annoying, Beyond Light signaled that players wouldn't have to worry about the hard reset that you would have to face if Destiny 3 would be announced. Destiny 2 was in it for the long haul. Bungie was committed to a years-long content plan that would keep the title fresh into the foreseeable future. Destiny was a proper MMO title offering players continuity for both the content and their Guardian avatar. And part of the new future version of Destiny 2 was committing to the longer narratives and pouring energy into creating interesting stories for the existing characters instead of adding new ones constantly. And that's where our old murder friend Aldrin Solvery entered the picture. The K-killing monster was resurrected this time and his name was Crow, a new guardian with no memory of the time he killed our fan-favorite robot in cold blood. And he was adorable. Destiny 2 rehabilitated the most hated in the galaxy into a beloved hero. The Witch Queen expansion is now taking the baton and carrying Destiny 2 into the next chapter of the saga. This time, players are venturing into a new location where they confront a scary skull-faced lady that I want nothing to do with. And we'll see what new curveballs the team at Bungie throws players as they make their attempt at the world first raid race to see which fire team can complete it first. The world first phenomenon is a pure fan service and Bungie even ships out IRL wrestling style belts to the players that beat the new raid before anyone else does in the world. 
700,000 players log into Destiny 2 every single day, give or take, and Bungie's physical footprint is expanding even further. The studio announced that they are doubling the size of their American headquarters later this year, and they're hard at work on Bungie Amsterdam, their first international studio. They've also announced plans to bring at least one new IP to market by 2025, which might be what caught Sony's eye. See, Bungie is a serial monogamous. First they were single, then they thought they were Microsoft, then they were single again, and then they thought they were Activision, and after they broke that relationship off, it was just a matter of time before they found a new honey to snuggle up with. It doesn't hurt that with that proposal comes a $3.6 billion rock attached. Destiny 2 Year 5 is officially underway, and with years of plans laid out ahead of us, Bungie has plenty of opportunity to resurrect Kate 6. Thanks for watching, and if you want to see more videos like this, check out our review of Halo Infinite and our breakdown of Cyberpunk 2077 one year later. I'll see you next time.